All right, uh, th I, I just want to thank LifeRay for, for having me come talk. It's interesting, there are, are really a lot of parallels between what LifeRay is doing and the maker movement. And I think as I go through this, you will see that there are, are parallels. And, and I don't really need to, to spell it out for you. You'll just see it. Um, so let's start with a, an interesting fact. This is uh, a picture of uh, some American farmers around the turn of the 20th century. And at that time, 80% of Americans were working on farms. Uh, they either lived on farms or, or they lived in, in rural areas and they would work on the farms. So by necessity, Americans had to be makers. They had to be resourceful. They had to be innovative. They had to come up with solutions to problems that, that, um, they, that they had to solve themselves. They couldn't, they couldn't farm out their problems. Today, in, in 2013, only 2% of people work on farms. So I was interested in looking at, at uh, farmers as makers. And one of the things I came across was this farming implement catalog from the, the uh, late 1800s. And it's incredible. It's a super thick catalog that is just filled with tools and implements and mechanisms. You could literally rebuild civilization after a zombie apocalypse with one of these catalogs. So we had all these makers, and they were really good at making things. And as the, as the world started to change, and these people, uh, the, the, uh, farmers and, and, and rural workers, were able to move into cities, they still had these skills. And there ended up becoming a hobbyist market for, the, for, for makers. And this guy, Hugo Gernsbeck, is, is more uh, uh, well known as being the father of science fiction. He came up with, uh, with uh, amazing stories, was, was the science fiction magazine that he created in, uh, in the 20s and uh, super popular. But even before that, he was doing these really cool like maker DIY technology magazines. Um, and some of the names are like The Electrical Experimenter, The Experimenter, Science and Invention, Radiocraft, Everyday Mechanics. And so he was serving this market of, of makers by necessity by giving them something to do when they weren't working. I think that's a picture of Hugo looking at the equivalent of a widescreen television set with a remote control. That little tiny uh, circle there is the, is the cathode ray tube of the TV. So here were some of the magazines that, uh, that he published. This was the Electrical Experimenter in 1917 and 1918. If you look at the, the kinds of articles that, that were in the magazine, these are exactly the kinds of things you would see today in Make Magazine or on Instructables or on, uh, on a number of online websites. Wireless transmission of power, free electricity from the wind, a radio-controlled model boat, electricity to prevent future fuel crisis, and utilizing burnt-out lamp bulbs. I mean, this is exactly the same thing. And so it's interesting, in a way, for the last 100 years or so, making has not changed at all. Um, I, I'm going to later show you how things are really changing. And we kind of hit what I'm calling a maker singularity. Um, but looking a little bit farther into, um, into these uh, Gernsbeck magazines, I, I started seeing some interesting coincidences. This is uh, an issue of Radio Craft magazine. And what we see here is a parabolic microphone so that you can listen to sounds from nature at a distance. And it's a really cool. Uh, uh, contraption that focuses all the sound waves in that parabolic dish and then reflects them and focuses that sound onto a microphone so you can pick up faint signals. And as soon as I saw that, I said, wow, we published the same article in Make Magazine, just a, a little bit of an updated version. This is parts that you can buy at a dollar store. Um, it's a, a small umbrella. You can see a paint roller, and you can see uh, a little uh, headset, uh, uh, wired headset for a cell phone. So it's like a $3 parabolic microphone. This is the radio hat. And uh, I, I think in the 30s, everybody had one of these. Um, but uh, when I saw it, I was like, wow, we did a, a uh, hard hat synthesizer with uh, essential LEDs coming out of it. So it's like all these things are, are, are they happened before. There, there's really like nothing new happening. It was interesting. Um, this is from 1961. Go karts were super popular um, in in Popular Science and Popular Mechanics magazine. I loved these magazines. This was kind of the model for Make magazine. Even the size of Make magazine 
uh, we, we made it the same size as, as popular mechanics. This one I really like because it's an electric go-kart. Uh, most of them use lawnmower engines. And again, when I saw this, I'm like, wow, we did it too. <laughs> it's interesting to see how that guy is being more safe and less safe at the same time. <laughs> this is a suitcase-sized power cycle. And uh, to, to be able to make that claim, they had to make a really big suitcase. But it's still a cool little thing. And again, this was in a recent issue of Make Magazine. This, this guy uh, on his chick magnet chopper here. Um, <laughs> that, uh, it's powered by a 36-volt uh, battery-powered drill. And it's got an incredible amount of low-end torque on it. I was riding around the make offices, and it just like scooted right out from under me, and I landed right on my butt. But we have the complete instructions in, in the magazine. Teaching her wireless. You can see he's really interested in teaching her Morse code. Um, but the funny thing is, when I go to like maker fairs or, or go to hacker spaces, I see that making is like a really popular couples activity. It really is true that couples love to make things together, and families like to make things together. So I've been showing you all this stuff from the past. Um, for a while, I think between 1970 and 2000, we saw this big dip in DIY and making. And I, I call it kind of the dark ages of, of making. And um, a, a good way to show that is, is take a look at these two uh, issues of the same magazine, one from 1973 and one from 2000. So the 1973 issue, we have a complete car care guide, putting your car in shape, keeping it running smooth. We have plans for vacation homes. We have how to wire a yard light, how to silence squeaky doors, how to hang shelves, how to repair a damaged roof, how to, how to, how to. It's all about making things, you know, taking care of the things that you have or inventing new things. And then we look at a 2000 issue of Popular Mechanics, the same magazine, and it is about stuff that you can't do at home. World's tallest building. You can't build the world's tallest building in your backyard. The fastest PC you can buy is not about making your own PC and brain implants, you're not gonna to wanna to do brain implants at home either. <laughs> so it's like, what happened? Why did that happen? And so here, you know, one of the reasons is, is this kind of this farming uh, know-how, ingenuity thing was starting to get weak as, as generations of, of people were born. They kind of forgot about those roots and they, their, their parents didn't teach them, their grandparents didn't teach them. The, the, the knowledge stream was getting, was getting thinner and thinner. But here's another big reason I think that, that it happened. And, and so um, take a look at this TV set. It's a 15-inch color TV set that you could buy in 1954. It cost $1,175. If you adjusted that for inflation, that would be like today going into the store and paying $9,700 for this TV set with a, not a very big screen. There's, you know, a uh, laptop screen is bigger than that. So if you had this TV set in 1954 and it, it stopped working, what would you do? Well, I can still remember when our TV would break, my dad would open the back of the TV. There was just kind of this, this chipboard backing that you could unscrew. And he would pull the tubes out of the sockets and we would drive to the drugstore, and you would plug the tubes into this machine. It was a tube testing station. And you can see uh, where the tubes fit, and a little uh, needle on a meter would tell you if the tubes were good or not, and then you could open the cabinet below and replace the tubes. So you were kind of invested in this TV set that you bought. You wanted to make sure it was so expensive that, that you wanted to make sure that it would continue to work. And this was a, a funny uh, picture I saw in Popular Science from 1962. This guy is giving a tip of how he would take his picture tube to, uh, to take it to the repair shop. He would pull the tube out of the TV and use the seat belt. And I was always wondering why people use seat belts in the 60s, because they didn't use them on people. So I guess they made them for, for picture tubes. So now let's go to 2003. You can buy a 19-inch color TV for $140 in today's money. That would be like someone in 1954 plunking down $17 and buying a TV set. So just another way to look at that. 
you, a 1954 customer would pay 70 times as much money for a smaller TV. So if you have one of these Target TVs that you paid $140 for and it breaks, what happens? <laughs> and you know, that's kind of, in a way, your, your only option because the, the parts in there are not, there, there are no user serviceable parts inside as the saying goes. The, the, the uh, components are all tiny. Um, chances are the thing is glued together rather than screws, so you couldn't even disassemble it then you, if you wanted to. And if you took it to a service place, they would tell you the same thing. They, it would cost much more to fix it than it would be to just buy another one. And so I think that's a big reason we saw this decline in, in uh, do-it-yourself is because people didn't need to make things anymore. They could just buy buy their solutions to everything rather than solving them. But in the same time that we had this uh, decline of do-it-yourself in, in the mainstream, we kind of had a do-it-yourself sub subculture renaissance. And I'm looking at things like the whole earth catalog in the 60s, punk rock in the 70s, the personal computer revolution in the 80s, and the zine revolution in the 90s. They were all about getting access to tools and technologies so that you could short circuit the existing systems that were preventing you from doing something and doing it yourself. And that is kind of what we're seeing on another level in the maker movement, and, and uh, it's really interesting. I'm seeing like these, so, so the modern movement we, we have kind of thanks to the subculture renaissance, um, I, I'm dividing it into two phases from 2000 to 2008. It was about people just saying, look what I made, look at this cool thing, and here's instructions, you can make it too. But what we've seen in the last few years is something that's really profoundly interesting. And I think it, what it is, is it's makers are making tools for other people to become makers and make really amazing things out of it. So, so it's like a desktop manufacturing revolution. Um, and it, it goes beyond that, too. I'll, I'll go into that a little bit. I uh, just wanted to uh, show you a little bit about some of the projects in Make Magazine. Um, our audience is what we call broad spectrum enthusiasts, people who are interested in making a lot of things. They're not just focused on one thing. Um, they might want to build a beehive and keep bees. Uh, they might want to work on their car. Uh, they might want to make musical instruments or robots or do curly in photography. Here's a guy, uh, this is an article from the magazine, who likes to take pictures of birds outside his window. So he set up a bird feeder and he would sit in his kitchen with the window open and try to take pictures of the birds. But as Murphy's Law would dictate, the bird was always behind the bird feeder. And he's like, this is a hassle, this is a drag. Because he would go outside to take a picture of the birds and they would fly away, he would scare them. So what he ended up doing is he put a remote control airplane servo on top of the bird feeder and then he used the remote control and he could rotate the bird feeder from his kitchen to get the proper viewing angle. And not only that, he realized, well, the, the remote, remote control's got another channel on it, so I will use the other uh, channel to attach, a, I'm, I'm going to attach another servo motor to my camera so that it will be like a little finger and press the shutter button. So he's just like driving, you know, he's like controlling his remote control and like taking all these pictures of birds. Here's some pictures of the birds that he took. So um, one of the things we like to do in Make Magazine at the beginning of each article is like take a top-down shot of what the workbench will look like when you're about to embark on a project. So you can see some of the things here. Can you tell what this project is? Yes, yeah, it's the potato cannon. That's great, yeah, exactly. So we've got a potato. That's the, the projectile. Um, we've got uh, a stun gun, which uh, will make a spark to trigger the... Uh, to trigger the a propellant, uh, and the propellant is right guard uh, after uh, uh, antiperspirant, flammable antiperspirant. What a cool idea. Um, <laughs> and so uh, this is what, so we, we want to do a little bit of a twist on it, so we used clear PVC. And so uh, it makes this amazing, like, sh super long uh, spout of fire when you, when you fire it at dusk. And then you probably remember those little water rockets that were white and red, and you would pump them up, and, and they would shoot in the air. Well, we wanted to make a really big one out of soda bottles, and so this is it. And uh, it's really cool. I mean, people love rockets, so we always have rockets, uh, spud guns, uh, drones, those kinds of things that fly and, and uh, uh, really popular and, and fun to make. That, that uh, 
rocket that you just saw could easily be made in an afternoon for parts that you would pick up at Lowe's or Home Depot or something. And this is one of my favorite ones. This guy hates the sound of an alarm clock waking him up in the morning. So he made a bacon alarm. <laughs> and uh, you know, it, it's exactly what it sounds like. At the, at the set time, a, an incandescent bulb starts heating up some bacon that was placed in there the night before. And then you wake up with that wonderful aroma, the bacon. <laughs> so these are all kind of stage, uh, um, stage one projects of modern making. Uh, the, the, the kind of the, fa the phase two is really what's, what's interesting to me, and I think it's going to point to some pretty profound changes that go beyond just the fun novelty factor of, of making things. What we're seeing with makers is that not only do they like to make things, but they like to make systems. And so what they've done is they have created DIY versions of all these things you see here that typically would require uh, the backing of a large organization to accomplish. So you have DIY versions of R&D, design, material sourcing, all these things that are very inexpensive, uh, but more importantly, really powerful and effective too. Some of them are intentional and some of them just kind of are, are emergent properties of, of the internet. One of the kind of emergent properties from, from uh, the internet in, in, term, in, in the R&D arena is just how, ex how ingenuity has accelerated because people are able to share designs and plans. I went on to Google Images and I typed in remote control lawnmower. And these are some of the first images I found. Imagine if you were interested in building a remote control lawnmower like 10 years ago. You'd have a really hard time finding information about it. You really, you know, you, could, you couldn't go around your neighborhood knocking on doors asking people. They would give you funny looks. But online, they won't give you funny looks. You're going to be able to meet, meet up online with the thousand people who've actually built one of these things. Not only that, more likely than not, they'll be happy to help you, giving you tips, uh, some of the pitfalls, um, uh, where they've got materials, all that kind of stuff. And you could build your own remote control lawnmower. Thanks to that, you have an online distributed R&D team that you can use, and companies can use too. An example of a company using uh, online R&D distributed teams. This is something that happened a long time ago, about 10 years ago, uh, when, when Usenet was still active. Um, it still might be, but anyway, there's a group called Alt.Coffee on the internet, and people would share tips about making really great cups of espresso. Like when you pour a perfect, shoot a perfect shot of espresso, you call it a god shot. And these guys are always seeking a god shot. And, and one of the things that you really need to control when you make espresso is uh, the, the temperature of the water. You really want uh, to, to lock into a certain temperature so that uh, uh, there are several variables. That's, but if you can lock down that one, that's, that's a, a step forward. So the red, the red line on the graph there shows the temperature variation in the water, uh, the, the, in, in, a, in a water tank on an espresso machine. And you can see it goes from about uh, a little less than 200 degrees up to 240 degrees. So you're having a, a 40 degree temperature swing when the espresso machine is telling you it's ready to pour a shot. And with that temperature variation, you're going to get wildly inconsistent results. Um, some guy who worked at the uh, US Bureau of Standards borrowed some lab equipment and took it home and hooked it up to his espresso machine. And it was a proportional integral derivative temperature controller. What it is is a way that uh, it, it's a temperature controlling mechanism that can lock in to a, a temperature and keep it very stable. That blue line is showing the, the, uh, the temperature variation when you use that. It's like 0.1 degree Fahrenheit. So it's 400 times more accurate than, than uh, the typical bimetallic thermostat that you've seen in an espresso machine. That drop there is when you pull a shot, and uh, that, that happens. There's nothing wrong with that. It's supposed to be like that. But anyway, so he created that, and people started selling kits and sharing instructions on how to modify all the different espresso machines out there. It became really big. The espresso machine manufacturing company companies, there, there are a lot of them, have been making espresso machines for over 100 years. They never thought of this. They have these engineering teams that are making these incremental improvements, but they never thought of adding PID to their machines. But sure enough, after a while, they're like, okay, you know, 
these guys are onto something. So they started adding PID to their machines too. So that kind of innovation that we're seeing is going to not only help individuals, it's going to help companies. They're going to see what people are doing with their products, how they're modifying them, and they're going to adopt them and bring them into the fold and, and into their products. Another great R&D um, opportunity are these maker spaces and hacker spaces that are cropping up all over the world. These are places where people can pay a fee of like $50 to $100 a month to have access to a space where they can go and use uh, things like laser cutters and 3D printers and computer controlled shop tools and um, have uh, uh, access to people who, who come and give workshops and train them. Uh, the, the greatest thing though is you get all these people together in the same room who are interested in making things and they collaborate on cool projects. I'll, I'll show you one of those near the end. Um, and then when it comes to design, uh, when I was, I, I started out as a mechanical engineer and I was designing disk drive components. And the first year I did it, I was using a drafting board with a pencil. The second year, we switched over to a CAD system. And it was like this giant workstation and you would just do these wireframe drawings and the software cost like $50,000 and you'd have to pay an hourly charge to use the software. A guy would come and like plug a dongle into the, uh, into the box and see how many hours you used it. Now you can download like SketchUp software or get free 3D design software that is literally 10,000 times more powerful and faster than the stuff I was using. So you've got people all over the world using really powerful free or super inexpensive CAD software and they're uploading their creations to digital model libraries so other people can take those plans and fabricate them using whatever uh, desktop manufacturing method they like. And this is, uh, these are plans uh, that you can find online for, for eyeglasses, gears, vice clamps. All, another thing when I was a mechanical engineer, I was having a really hard time finding components. Like if you wanted to find a certain kind of a motor or something like that, it was really hard, but the internet itself has become like an indexed surplus store. So if you want to find a part, it's really easy. Um, eBay is a great place, Alibaba. I went to eBay because I wanted a photo resistor. It's a, resist it's a component that changes its resistance value based on how much light is hitting it. So eBay, I found this company that's selling 20 photo resistors for $2, shipping included, and it's mailed to you from Hong Kong. I have no idea how they make a profit on doing that, but they, they uh, it, it actually works. You can buy uranium ore online. <laughs> the, the problem is, though, if you want to get low strength uranium, it's OK. But if you want super high or ultra high strength, it's sold out. It's a little <laughs> scary. Um, 3D printers, I don't need to tell you really about 3D printers because they, they've really hit the mainstream now. This is a shop in, in New York that Maker, MakerBot's retail space selling 3D printers. I just think one of the cool things you can do with 3D printers is make other 3D printers like this guy did. You made a 3D printer using a 3D printer. There's a, a device called the Arduino. It's a, it's a small uh, printed circuit board about the size of a credit card. And it lets ordinary people, mere mortals, be electrical engineers because you can emulate, other, you can emulate circuits very easily with a little bit of code, uh, a little bit of programming, and um, you can do all sorts of things. Like this thing I call the, re I, re I didn't call it this, uh, Michael Hart calls a reverse geocache puzzle box. It's a box that opens on one spot only on the planet. You press a button and if you're not in the right spot, it won't open. And that little display in there will tell you how far away you are from the point. And also it will give you 20 tries and if you don't get it, it will never open. Um, this uh, uh, cr crowd, uh, crowdsourced funding, before if you wanted to uh, uh, take your product to market, you could either fund it out of pocket or find venture capitalists. Crowdsourced funding kind of finds that middle ground where if you need between 20,000 to a couple hundred thousand dollars, you can, you can post your, your proposal online to Indiegogo or Kickstarter. And, uh, see if people think your idea is good enough. And so these guys who made an, iPod, an, an I, iPhone tripod mount got over $130,000 so that they could develop the tooling for it. It's called the Glyph. That's a really cool uh, way to uh, make movies with your 
with your iPhone. My daughter was just using it last yesterday to make a stop motion movie for a class project. And then uh, uh, CNC, uh, computer numerical control equipment, is getting cheaper and cheaper. This is called a shop bot. You can buy one for about $20,000. Uh, a couple I know named Jeffrey and Jillian from Oakland make really beautiful office interiors using it. These are chairs and a table that they designed for Emily the Strange's offices. Laser cutters can cut wood and plastic and, and other uh, materials, and they're getting to be the price of laser printers. And people can have businesses around those, like uh, balsa wood airplane makers, uh, model airplane makers can use laser cutters instead of uh, having die cut tooling uh, costs that are really expensive. You can just get one of these and do your iterations and make all your mistakes right there on site. Uh, the internet has allowed people to start their own companies. This guy is 12 years old. His name is Quinn, and he started a company called Q Tech Now, and he sells little add-ons for Arduino that have various capabilities. The uh, one in the lower right-hand corner is his best seller. It's a fart detector. <laughs> and you hook that up to a, a, an alarm, and you can imagine the hilarity. <laughs> Here's an example of some of the things that people are making with this kind of phase two uh, creations. You can see they look like stuff that would come out of a, a, a big consumer electronics corporation. But these are made by individuals, and that's because that's this, this power of this organizational advantage killing technologies that DIYers have come up with. Um, uh, here's some people. They have a company called Backyard Brains. They've made a remote control cockroach. That's a real cockroach, and it has a little circuit board glued onto its back and some electrodes attached to its antenna. And you can set it on the ground and steer it with a remote control and have it go in different directions. This is a device that uh, Steve Hofer made with uh, some little uh, ultrasonic range detectors uh, that show you how far away you are from something, and then some cell phone vibrators, and an Arduino. And it's designed for blind people to walk around and not run into things because uh, it will start thumping on their hand if they get close to a chair or a table or something like that. And he put this together for under $100 in a weekend. Imagine 15 years ago, if someone wanted to make something like that, the costs that uh, would have been required to put something like that together. He also made a secret knock gumball machine, which is uh, dispenses gum only if you know the secret knock. This is a great example of all this kind of phase two technology coming together. Um, when Japan had the Fukushima disaster, the radiation readings were unreliable. People didn't know. Uh, where they were being taken, there weren't enough data points. Uh, uh, it was just not transparent. So a hackerspace in Tokyo and a hackerspace in LA got together and said, what can we do to solve this? This is their answer. It's called the B Geige. It's got a Geiger counter in it. It's got a GPS unit in it. It's got a Wi-Fi radio in it. And it's got a memory card. And so they've made a bunch of these. And they have people hang them in little pouches out of their window in Japan. And, 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 and they say, just drive around as you normally do. Go on your commutes, go shopping, uh, take family trips. And what they've done is they've mapped over 10 million points of radiation readings uh, combined together. And they all, when these uh, devices collect data points and come within range of a Wi-Fi, uh, open Wi-Fi uh, hotspot, it uploads the data. So now you can see all the data points that are taken over time, and you can slice and dice all this information any way you want. It's, it's open source and free. So um, it's just a great example of what can be done when, when people are using these technologies that, that have, have quashed organization, getting together the, the, the power of the internet for distributed collaboration and, uh, and iteration uh, capabilities of all these tools. It, it does wonderful stuff. But th this is something that I want to end with. I've shown you all this cool stuff, but really, this is about the heart of making. This is a guy named Scott Weaver. I met him at Maker Fair a couple of years ago. And this is his complete set of tools and materials. A razor blade, boxes of toothpicks, and bottles of glue. That's it. And here's what he makes with it. This is like a 3D sculpture of San Francisco, and it's huge. It's really big. And you put marbles in it, and they roll down tracks and take a tour of all the highlights of San Francisco. So I, I uh, said to Steve, I said, this is so cool. Can I take your picture so that I can show people who you are? He said, yes. Let me put on my costume first. <laughs> there he is. 
So anyway, he's, he's like, he's what making is all about. All the tools and technology and all that is great because it enables you to do things, but you don't even need any of that. All you need is, you know, your equivalent of what toothpicks, glue, and razor blades are. Um, I, th that's it, but I just want to remind you that uh, if you take the escalator to the Pacific Concourse, you can see some of the things uh, that make uh, magazine has uh, its contributors have created, and you can kind of play around with some of the technologies. And we also have uh, a promo code, so you can download a free copy of our upcoming 3D printer issue. You can get a PDF of it. I think the code is LifeRay. And also, we'll be giving away copies of the magazine. And I'll be hanging out down there if you want to, if you want to chat. But uh, thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. <laughs>